Abortion happens every day. Millions of people around the world will have an abortion each year. But the majority of those people will never talk about their abortion experiences. What if millions of people broke their silence and told the truth about their lives and their choices? This is Melissa Madera in Bangkok, Thailand, and you're listening to the Abortion Diary Podcast. These are the stories we share. So 10 years ago this August, um, Katrina barreled down on the city of New Orleans and changed everything in, uh, in my life. I evacuated with my roommate at the time, um, our two cats, um, about 24 hours before the storm actually made landfall. We went to my mom's house um, in Northeast Texas and um, we had some other friends that evacuated to there as well. Um, so we all kind of gathered around the television and watched um, as Katrina made landfall and um, over the next few days really uh, you know, started to understand the sort of severity of what had occurred. Um, it was about the end of that first week so sometime in early September of 2005, that it occurred to me that in the hurriedness of the evacuation, I had actually not grabbed um, another pack of uh, birth control. I was taking Nuva Ring at the time, and mine was expiring. So I called one of the local women's health clinics and asked if I could get an emergency prescription um, for a refill. And they were, I guess the policy was that they, because I'd never been a patient there before, I would have to have a full exam for them to write me a prescription. Um, and the earliest that they could fit me in was an appointment three weeks from that day. So I made the appointment, um, but you know, in the interim, uh, my boyfriend and I, um, who had been together for over three years at that point, had unprotected sex and you know i know very much about how you know how to prevent pregnancy um, but really i was sort of thinking that you know if we use the old pull out method and uh, it would probably be fine i hadn't ever been off birth control for more than a month since i was 15 years old um, so it seemed crazy to me to think that maybe it would actually immediately leave my system. Uh, I thought maybe I, I'd have some kind of stored up um, in, in my system. But uh, uh, so, you know, I think, think that happened. Um, and it was, um, it was five weeks after I evacuated before my neighborhood was reopened and I was able to return back to New Orleans. Um, and when I did, it was very clear that my house was not livable. Um, it didn't flood, so I was lucky in that regard, but there were big gaping holes in the roof and lots of the ceiling um, had caved in and it was sort of leaning to one side. Um, there were a lot of cracks in the walls um, and it also was one of um, a dozen or more properties that this uh, landlord had and, and this one was actually in the best shape so it was not a huge priority. So my boyfriend and I just packed up our stuff and um, went back to my mother's house in Northeast Texas to try to figure out what we were gonna do next. And, um, uh, and it was, you know, around that time, sometime um, around the fifth or sixth week after um, this whole ordeal began with the evacuation from New Orleans ahead of Katrina, that um, I was like, oh, I missed a period. Um, and I thought that it was probably just stress um, because I was under quite a big a deal of stress. Um, so I went to get a pregnancy test and I bought a two pack um, and I took one of the tests and it was positive and so I took the other test and it was positive so I pretty much broke down at that point I mean I had no job um, I didn't have a place to live and I didn't even have a city um, to return to and my boyfriend was very supportive of me um, 
whatever I wanted to do, he would support me. Um, but he was a musician in a band that were just sort of getting their career going. And so to ask him to get off the road or to really think through being 25 years old and, um, you know, basically being a single mom under those circumstances was a little too much to bear. Um, when I talked to my mom about it, she also was very supportive. And then she shared with me that when she was 17, she'd had an unwanted pregnancy and had decided to terminate it and that it was the hardest thing that she'd ever done. Um, so after a lot of soul searching, I really just decided that at 25, this was not my baby. And so I made an appointment uh, at the clinic in Shreveport, Louisiana, which was just over um, the border, about an hour from my mother's house. Um, and uh, they, there was, there's a, a law in Louisiana that you have to have a, a waiting period. So you go and you have an exam and a consultation and then um, there's a waiting period so you can't um, have the procedure on the same day. So um, there was a full day of just sort of sitting there. I had you know, made this decision and knew what I wanted to do um, and then was just sitting there and being made to kind of wallow in, um, in a, a lot of those sort of hard feelings. Um, but ultimately, I had the procedure. Everything went fine. I was um, just under five weeks um, or around five weeks. And I think from that point on, I really realized that you know, I needed to kind of get my act together. So um, I needed to be ready to have a baby the next time I got pregnant. Um, and I also needed to make sure that that next time was not an accident. Um, so since then, um, I went back to graduate school. Um, I've been gainfully employed. Uh, um, my boyfriend at the time of Katrina and I split up. We're still good friends, um, but I met someone new got married, and now have a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter. So um, I don't think back on that experience as being um, one that, that torments me. I f think back on that experience as being the one that motivated me. I wondered if you could share a little bit about just navigating, first of all, navigating the system in Louisiana and during Katrina. <laughs> Um, so I actually knew very well the clinic um, in Shreveport um, because it's it's the only one or maybe one of two um, in the whole region of North Louisiana. And I had actually taken a friend to that clinic in high school um, to have an abortion, uh, so I knew exactly where to go. Um, they the The staff at that clinic was really great. I mean, very very gentle. Um, the clinic was just really quiet and very calm. And, you know, they, they, in Louisiana, we have a lot of laws about things that they have to tell you and videos that you have to watch. And um, it's gotten worse. Some of those weren't, um, some of the worst actually um, weren't in place when, when I had my procedure. But, um, you know, I think that it was, I could tell sort of that the staff struggles a little bit with um, having to, had to, having to deal with that. Um, and, and those were the, the only moments during all of my experience at the clinic where it didn't feel nurturing and loving um, and felt sterile and, um, you know, just the void of any sort of emotional connection. So, you know, it makes me think that that's, you know, probably having a really big impact on people's experiences. And, you know, I think there's a heavier burden now on clinic staff to, to go through those processes, which is really sucking up a lot of the emotional energy that it seemed very clear to me that they wanted to spend on the patients. 
first the consultation I went to by myself and then um, the procedure when I had the procedure my boyfriend went with me and he also actually had said that um, they were very nice apparently there's a um, world famous pie like a diner that has world famous pies um, just a couple blocks from the clinic and um, and you know there were a, a lot of people mostly men in the waiting area uh, waiting for people to finish their procedure and um, everybody was talking about the pies and the clinic staff was saying you know while you're waiting you might want to go try this pie and people were coming back oh I just tried the pie and so um, anyway he uh, he likes to actually tell that uh, tell that story um, because he thought it was really funny. So that's the first thing that we did when we left was go get a piece of pie. How was the pie? It's really good. So it is what I'll say. Yeah, okay. yeah. I had um, uh, chocolate, what a chocolate, you know, chocolate mousse or whatever pie. What, what do they even call that? Um, and my boyfriend had cherry, which I thought was kind of boring. Hope Medical Center, there's a pie place right around the corner. Why do you want to share your story? Uh, I think that it's important for us to break down the stigma of with abortion. The you know the statistics that this is not um, you know an uncommon experience experience for people that um, that there are a lot of um, you know middle class white people that have abortions, there's all of this sort of misinformation about who's having abortions and why. Um, and I think that that is able to be perpetuated um, and that myth is, is able to be, policies are, are, are being crafted under, you know, under this myth and, and perpetuating um, a lot of this myth because they don't know what people's real experiences are. Um, and I think that there's been a real effort to shame women um, who are thinking about having an abortion or have had an abortion. And to me, that just seems really, really dangerous. And I'm hoping that by sharing my story, I am contributing to you know, giving permission to other women to share their stories. Um, and we can start to, you know, chip away at this, this stigma and the shame that's attached with this experience. Have you shared the story often? Um, I've only, I've shared it in, in a letter once before um, about five years ago and then just recently, I uh, shared it out loud um, to people that I didn't know very well. They were um, definitely allies, but not friends. And so uh, I think that it's good. You know, I think it's the, the first time is the hardest because you're not really sure how, people's, how people will react to it. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm hoping that you know, at some point I'll have the courage to, you know, share it with other people and, you know, with um, people that are actually making these decisions about uh, abortion access for women because I think that it's important that they, um, that they meet real people that are going through this experience and understanding the variety of circumstances that bring women to this and, to, you know, how how difficult, how much more difficult they're making the experience for women. I think that, you know, if just hearing more people, I mean, it's almost as a, you know, coming out of the closet type thing to me. Um, I really just think that I'd like more women to share their stories, for them to be um, public, for, them to be on the media for it to be more of a common thing um, as part of someone who's had this experience's biography um, 
and public story um, about themselves because that's going to give more women courage um, and you know help women to say well you know if she had that experience or if she can talk about it then I don't have to feel so ashamed about it. As always, for more information about the Abortion Diary podcast, visit us on the web at theabortiondiary.com or email me with your questions or comments. If you would like to share your story, send me an email at melissa at theabortiondiary.com or visit our website, click on Share Your Abortion Story and fill out our contact form. If you're a fan of the podcast and would like to help us reach more folks, please subscribe on iTunes and write a review or rate this podcast. Your reviews and ratings will help us grow in the iTunes rankings and reach more people. I would also love to hear from you. You can also follow The Abortion Diary on Twitter or Facebook. And The Abortion Diary can't continue without your support. Support The Abortion Diary by making a tax-deductible donation to us on Fractured Atlas or buying some of our wristbands or totes on Store Envy. And a special thanks to you for listening. I'll be back next week with a new story.